Hi, I'm Brian Register. I teach philosophy at Austin Community College, and I want the next generation of Texans to be taught the truth about our history. I wasn't, and it's messed with my thinking about America for decades. On August 10, 1862, a few dozen Union loyalists from German Central Texas were murdered by Confederate soldiers as they were trying to escape to freedom in Mexico. This event is known as the Nueces Massacre. One of the very few monuments to the Union and the former Confederacy stands in comfort in honor of their loyalty. On August 11th, a few of us joined them for that annual ceremony, and we were allowed to read the names of the fallen. It's important to honor the honorable. But we didn't stop there. To express our dedication to accuracy and historical education, we marched 20 miles through the German part of Central Texas Hill Country along State Highway 87 from Comfort to Fredericksburg, speaking with local amateur historians who were doing as much to preserve history as an equivalent number of college professors. And they aren't doing it because it's their job or that they'll get paid, but just because history matters. We didn't talk with them about politics, and I don't know what they would think about social studies curricula, but you can see that there are Texans who care about accuracy in historical education, and I don't want you to betray these very gracious people's passion for history by teaching confusion and falsehood. Here are just a few of the things that we learned from the good people of the Comfort Heritage Society at the Troyer de Union Monument, they're led by Ann Stewart, and from Fredericksburgers Glenn Tribes and Randy Rupley. There weren't a lot of us, but we were very popular. Welcome. A couple things I'd like to say, and that is today we call this, this organization the Union Loyal League. They did not call themselves that. They called themselves the organization. The couple of letters that we have actually found from the actual people call it the organization. The man who called it the Union Loyal League was the contract surgeon from Brackettville who worked for the Confederates. His name was Edmund Downs. And he was the one, we, I read this letter, he wrote to the guy in San Antonio and he said, Colonel Grave, those, those, lo those, league, those loyal league people over here in the Frio River giving us hell, same as they gave us over in the Comfort area. You got to send more troops over here. <laughs> so that's the first, that's the earliest we can, and that was about 64. And that's the earliest that we have found any reference to loyal league. These people call it the organization. It was from the 1854 Singer Fest in New Braunfels because that's where everybody stood up and was counted. Huh? And unfortunately for everybody, the Adolph Dewey, who was the editor of the, of the San Antonio paper, wrote about it and he wrote about it in English. Otherwise, they'd all still be alive today. But no, Dewey writes about it in English so that everybody knows where the Germans stand. So yeah, we do know. That they have a singer fest. They have a shooting club. They have a singing club. They have a picnic club. They have an athletic club. And this is these like-minded people that go around. This is a picture of downtown Comfort from 1854 to the, to the Civil War. And what they wrote was a handwritten newspaper. And in it, they gave Alf Yelf, the farmer, they gave the, the founder, they gave Alf Yelf hell. They called him the snob. They called him the aristocrat. They called him the person in charge. And every time he got drunk and had to be appear before the JP, they wrote about it to their mothers, because I read the letters, okay? <laughs> they were so glad. Faultine and his uncle got their noses smashed in on High Street, on 7th Street, and they had to pay the JP. He had it coming. The guy from Sisterdale wrote home to his mother in Sisterdale uh. to tell him that, so that's, that's how we know that. Um, this is the man who started the organization. His name was Edward Dagner. He was from Sisterdale. He was a member of the failed revolution of 1848 in Germany. He had to get out of Germany so that he would still be alive, that he could come up. He said, okay, we lost the revolution in Germany. We can go to Texas and set it straight. At the 1854 Sanger Fest, the Germans who could have came together for the political side of that, decided that they would secede from Texas from just outside New Braunfels all the way to El Paso. It'd be called the free state of German West Texas. And once you got in there, you were free. Now, we want your children to go to school, don't care if they're brown, white, or black, but your children have to go to school because Germans are well-educated, and if you're gonna live in German West Texas, you got to be educated. And that was the only rule as far as we could ever find. You can find it online, it's 1854 Constitution, of the Singer Fest in New Braunfels, and you can read it. It's got a great platform. No lawyers. 
Everything has to be open on Sundays. Yes, you can go to church, but don't talk to us about it, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But all these young men, all these men who took off and left from here, can you imagine you swore allegiance to the United States when you came into this country. You believe, said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wholeheartedly believe in this country. And then you're being asked very quickly. I mean, you came here in 1854, and all of a sudden you're being asked to, to take sides and asked to, to fight for a government once again. I wonder if some of those uh, men uh, were just wanting to get away, not really siding with anything. They, 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 they just wanted freedom and they, you know, I can't imagine as I have been told that, you know, they, they, they were uh, union sympathizers with the exception of not having uniforms on. Correct. And I, I just think how horrible it must have been to leave your family, to know that you're, you're going into dangerous territory and what are you really standing up for? You're standing up for freedom, you're standing up for the ability to make your own choice. Yes, Richard Dabler was 16, he was the youngest. Henry Steeler was the second youngest, he was 17. Um, Henry Steeler was one of those who escaped from the battle, came up, he was, he was found out in Kerrville, and they took him to White Oak Creek and hung him with his friends, Mr. Buckish and Mr. Burner. Uh, his mother and his sister rode there from Comfort up to, up to White Oak Creek to get his body and it was too deteriorated hanging in the tree to take it down. So someone took it down for them and the sister covered it with brush and said, I'm coming back to get it at a later date. Something happened to the mother and the Steeler family are very reticent on that fact, but the mother lost her mind. Mrs. Wilhelmina Steeler lost her mind and she was uh, she was 38 when it happened and she lived for 39 more years and every day of her life she felt like the confederates were coming she said the confederates are coming the confederates are coming they told me they would come and get me for what i did well the Steelers won't tell us what they did and neither did wilhelmina's the younger wilhelmina the sister her family wouldn't tell us and i don't really blame them finally they <sighs> Mr. Steeler, Gottlieb Steeler, free thinker whose name means God's love, mm. went to the commissioner's court in Kerr County and said, and you can read the you can read the transcript for yourself, my wife has lost her mind and she's crazy. What can I do about it? And they said, you can put her in the same asylum, but it's gonna cost you ten dollars cash a month. And he said, We can afford that. And they said, Well then you take him over there and we'll give you the writ that your wife is insane. How come is she insane? She doesn't do anything anymore. She doesn't feed the boys. She doesn't do the chickens. She doesn't make the meals. She doesn't get the water. She sits there and she's afraid in the barn of the Confederates. So Mr. Got, Mr. Steeler got his, the, the, the commissioner's court were the ones who had to mm -hmm. uh, admit you to the, it's called the insane asylum. Uh, John, get that picture right there behind me. There you go. Uh, it's called the insane asylum and we went and read all the records. She was treated for mania caused by the war, and this is where she was treated. It, uh, so they would have called that PTSD today. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what they would have yeah. called it. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. And this is the young woman, or this is the woman that when she was young went and got her brother's body twice and brought it home. Now, he's supposed to be buried on the farm next to us, but we have gone over that farm with a fine tooth comb and we have found no depression anywhere. So I don't know if she, actually got him home or not but that's that is part of that story this, this is how a little comfort changes their family the Steelers came in about 1856 our family as John said came in 1860 we're right next to each other out on North Creek Road okay mm -hmm. we share a fence well, both of us look like white trash with that fence, okay? You know what a white trash fence looks like, right? It's like it needs money and time and labor and people. Well, we don't, we haven't done that fence yet, and we're still neighbors today. One of the Steelers has uterine cancer, one of the Steelers has Huntington's disease, and the third Steeler is a Confederate, which I think is an incredible story for Comfort, Texas. <laughs> Uh, Michael, what would you like to say about this? I already asked my one question. Well, that's asking. That's not saying. That's true. I just like just always baffles me that it, on horseback it took them that long to get over there, and on foot it took them less than half the time to get back. 
you know, this is the man who led them, Fritz Tegner. He's the guy who led them away. And they, all the way you see in all these interviews, the people saying, why are we hurrying? We're not going fast enough. And he said, we're okay. The governor gave us 30 days to get out of Texas because he gave all the traders a chance for 30 days. Well, we can't have ever, we have never found that order, not in the Confederate records and the archives, not in the governor's, not anywhere we found that order. But he thought they were. And so they stopped early every day. They hunted, they sang. We were free thinkers. They debated every night around the fire about, you know, should we, should we, when we go back to comfort, start a church? Should when we go back to comfort, secede from the Texas and, and, and set up a state where everything is done right? Because you need to know Germans are superior to everybody else because we think it through and got huge amounts of brains. And how we lost the 48 revolution, we'll never know, but we are going to do it right this time. Just nobody came back. The men, the men who, the old men who stayed went to San Antonio and went into politics and every survivor of the of the massacre, everybody who survived here and everybody who survived, everybody's a large term, but when you start looking at the names, they gave them, the, Mr. Degner gave them appointed jobs. They were like, um, oh, the guy who does the import and export. He made one of them the director of the insane asylum. He gave everybody a job. He made them state surveyors. Every man who survived the battle and who survived part of that like-mindedness was given a government job in Austin and they lived happily and very well ever after. Two women lost their minds, Mrs. Steeler and Mrs. Dagner. Mrs. Dagner lost both her boys. It's, it's a heartbreaking letter he wrote Mama baked bread for Hugo and Hillmore today. It's enough to last them for a week to get to Mexico. It made Mama very sad. It's just this like, oh, you know, because those ladies made such marvelous bread, and you know those young men were so happy. So, yeah, that was the way it was. He goes, oh, this is really great. You need to go talk to a lady up on the corner. Her name is Anne. You need to go introduce yourself to Anne. So that's how Anne and I met about 14 years ago, uh, something like that. And she sat me down and said, all right, you got to understand, you got you kind of got a picture of those things, but you don't quite get it that this these sides are still as alive today as they were 150 years ago. And I went, oh, come on. I'm a, I'm a northern kid. I'm from <laughs> Seattle, Washington. They're, yeah, they could not possibly have this animosity still between Confederate. <laughs> That's not even possible. She goes, oh, it really oh. is. If you go that way 10 miles or that way 10 miles, you're going to figure it out. And oh, yeah. sure enough, uh, I was in Sisterdale and somebody, we were out talking and we we're having a couple of drinks and this guy said, so are you a Union guy or a Confederate guy? I went, are you kidding me? Really? The Germans out here are supposed to have been very interested in education. So how did Absolutely. that kind of value come about? At the kindergarten in Germany, mm -hmm. that was unheard of in Europe. And my, I mean, it was just, uh, we. I have a whole bookcase of books that were brought from Germany in those trunks where you had to bring the things to stay alive. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the oldest one is from the 1700s and it's on the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. But if you tie in the fact that the American Revolution and the French Revolution influenced the intellectuals in Germany to try to bring that about in Germany, uh, missed the revolution of 1848 was unsuccessful and we were in the middle of all that when we were leaving at that theory, I mean those theories and that thought, uh, like uh, the uh, Boys of Box, our leader of our colony, they had 30,000 books in their library. That's a lot now for personal yes. Yes. And so they were very educated, cultured people who came. And I say, I have, you might have a book on how to build a mill. You had a book of old German songs printed, I think, in 1842. Now, those songs would be something if they were old German songs in 1842. Wow. And a, just a range of political and note and, and things for the housewife that they brought in their trunks. Uh, here we are in uh, Fredericksburg. We're in uh, what is apparently the first black church in the area. Um, we have local historian and reconstructionist, Randy Ruckley, who I will tell you is a bit of a delight to talk with. Um, and he's done some restoration work on this place, and he's going to tell us a bit about the church here. Hit it. Okay, well, this church uh, was originally on a plot that was uh, a part of the uh, German immigration company. 
in German uh, language, we call it the Vereinsenschutz Deutsche Einwanderer in Texas, which means the Society for the Protection of German Immigrants in Texas. Now, this was a, 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 a Gesellschaft, a society, a corporation to colonize Texas, which was put together by members of each state in the German Confederation. So this property was then allotted to a German immigrant when he came to Texas. And after the Civil War, so many Germans had suffered for their opposition to slavery, for their opposition to secession. Uh, 2,000 Germans took to the hills and fought the Texas Rangers, fought the Confederacy. Many Germans uh, spent the duration of the war in Mexico. Uh, many Germans gave up their dream of settling in Texas and moved on to California. Uh, the Drezels, for example, moved on to California and founded a, the uh, Gundlach Bunshu Vineyard, which still exists today. Uh, after the Civil War in 1871, black families came up the road to Fredericksburg looking for a new home to escape the post-Civil War injustice that was taking place across the country. They didn't feel safe anyway, but when they came to Fredericksburg, they were welcomed with open arms. And they received this property, and here they built a school and this church. Now the school is no longer here, it was next to this property. And it's been moved to another location, and I believe it serves as a bed and breakfast now. So that, that uh, historical building is still here in town. The church was in service with the black families for many years, but over the past several decades, uh, since I suppose the 1950s, it fell into disrepair. On several occasions, I believe in the 1970s or 80s, some renovation work was done, but uh, for years it had been left alone, and members and descendants of the black families who originally came here, the former slaves, had moved on to their other lives. Now just a few years ago, Dr. Phillips, a colonel in the U.S. Army and a doctor, uh, decided to move back to town. And just about the time that he moved back to town, this church was slated for removal. It was in uh, such poor repair, it, it really we, you can imagine it was almost not salvageable, but it had to be salvaged. This is, a, most of the church is really good uh, substance for construction. It's only pine, uh, cut shortly after the Civil War, I suppose. And uh, you can see that in the, in the floors. This is, uh, most of the floor here is uh, salvaged longleaf pine from other structures in the vicinity, but I'd say about a third of it is original wooden floor to the church. The pews here are all made out of uh, ancient longleaf pine. It's harder than oak and yet sappy like pine. Really difficult material to work with. Uh, the windows were in such ill repair, most of the, the glass was broken, and the windows were rotten, so rotten from dry rot that they felt like balsa wood. So I reconstructed all the windows out of Longleaf pine, a longleaf pine beam that was salvaged in Austin. And uh, I made just exact duplicates of the original windows which, which were here and were put together by these former slaves. The windows don't contain any nails, screws, glue. It's all held together just with the, the holes and the pegs through them. Most of the glass is original too. If you look closer, you'll see some of the wavy glass, and that's, that's the original glass. Not all of it's uh, Original. These broken paints here are new. We'll need replacing soon. This is wavy glass. You might not be able to tell. <laughs> now, some of the glass, the wavy glass you see, is original glass, say from 1871. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we noticed that particular characteristic of the glass because certainly glass has been replaced over the years. You know, glass might have been broken in 1910 in 1935 and 1980, and uh, you could tell what type of glass was used at certain times. Some even had stamps on it. So, so Gary Hunter uh, became involved. He's a descendant uh, and member of the family uh, that has history here in this church. 
and he did uh, really most of the renovation here and put a lot of uh, blood and sweat in his, into this renovation. Um, so there's a rumor that this church was burnt at some point? And, and one member of the family of the descendants did say that, uh, that she thought that the church had been burned at some point. Now that's very interesting. Now I, I um, might cast some doubt on this because I dug the, the new foundation around the church. I've dug uh, up to three feet around the entire perimeter of the church and I didn't find anything charred. Uh, no evidence of any other construction than the original church here. Uh, I, I think that if the church had been burned to the ground, there would be plenty of evidence for it. Uh, in the ground. And it seems also like the windows would have been very differently reconstructed than they would have been originally. Right, and, and also that all of the original material in the church was obviously dated to 1871, and they were all here and intact, although much of it was dry rot. Sure. And, uh, and, and that would have to be replaced. Uh, so I, I don't think that the church was burned. I think that might be sort of an urban myth that may have its origins in the civil rights movement, maybe earlier. There was the Hoodoo War of the 1870s. This was a continuation of the Civil War in the Texas Hill Country with Texas Rangers fighting Germans who lived here, killing one another. And certainly these former Confederates, these Texas Rangers, would not have appreciated the hospitality that the German community extended to these former slaves. But they also didn't appreciate how the Germans were dealing with the Comanche, am I right? Well, that's true. The, the Texas Rangers were originally put together in 1823 to fight specifically the Comanche tribe. And uh, the Comanche people know that. The Comanche nation now resides in Oklahoma. And the German-Comanche Treaty signed here in 1847 intended that the Comanches and the Germans live in peace for all eternity. And that treaty was always honored, and we still honor it today. Every Comanche and every German in this community, and millions of Germans in, in Germany know about this treaty and still re respect this history. The, the Germans were appalled when they read in their newspapers across the German Confederation in 1842, they read about the Council House fight in San Antonio, where the Texas Army, Texas Rangers, had invited to treat with Comanche chiefs and then murdered them and opened fire on women and children. And uh, Germans and their leaders thought they needed to undertake something to change this. And uh, that's part of the reason why so many Germans were eager to come here to Comanche territory and live among the Comanches. Texas at that time actually was really more on the other side of what's now I-35 in Austin. And this wasn't really a part of the, the original Texas. Texas all of a sudden grew on the map after the victory in the Mexican War in 1848 in the Treaty of Hildago. Suddenly the Texans had a very large map of Texas, okay. larger than it is today. But if you look back at the older maps, it's a much smaller colony uh, east of Austin. And this was all the sovereign territory of the Comanche Nation. Now, a lot of people when they talk about the Comanche Treaty, they uh, say, oh, well, it was only specifically with the Penateca tribe. Well, yes, the Penateca tribe was here. Uh, but it says quite clearly at the top of the, the what's known as the Moisebach Treaty, this German Comanche Treaty of 1847, it says that this is between the Fevines and Schutze Deutsche Einwand in Texas, which is literally the German Confederation, what is Germany, and the Comanche Nation, all Comanches of the Comanche Nation. The Comanches accept this interpretation, as well as the Germans. And every year, Comanches and German uh, diplomats and excellencies celebrate this treaty as being perhaps the only treaty with Native Americans that was never broken. And uh, during the Civil War, some Germans actually fought together with the Comanches against Texas Rangers and raided the homes of Texas Rangers. Uh, most uh, of Notoriety is uh, Hammond Lehman, who was kidnapped as a, a young boy by Apaches, not the Texas Apaches, but from some uh, Apache tribe from further out west of New Mexico. And he spent uh, some time with them on their adventures and perhaps wasn't treated very well. 
And uh, he later wrote a book about this, which he said himself is mostly fiction. He didn't approve of it. It's a typical uh, captive story. And when you study captive stories, this is just another one of them. And he said that himself. So don't believe uh, the stories about him being roasted over a fire <laughs> like a, a rotisserie chicken. There's actually a picture of that in the original book. He said that didn't happen and it didn't happen. Uh, that was to sell books. Uh, but one bit of truth in the story is that he, uh, he was then later adopted by the Comanche Nation. And when the Comanche saw these Apaches on the warpath with a German boy, they said, you can't have him. <laughs> we live in peace with the Germans. And he became a member of the Comanche tribe. Uh, in his uh, fight against the Texas Rangers, that's also well documented. And he told the stories himself later in his, in his life after the Indian Wars had ended. So we usually think of the Texas Rangers as a law enforcement organization, and you know people will talk about problems with law enforcement in general. Um, but you know we also most of us appreciate the, that police keep us safe. Um, but it sounds like there was a little bit more kind of that it was a little bit more of a conquering force almost. Yes, there are. It's very well documented by Texas Rangers in their own words mm -hmm. when we the the. Enthusiasts who love this sort of uh, history of Texas Rangers can't really overlook the, the exact quotes and statements made by these Texas Rangers. One of them uh, telling the story once how he uh, picked up a snake as a young boy and held it by the neck and then he was afraid to drop it. So he called over one of the slaves and commanded the slave to remove the snake safely from his hand and threaten if you don't do it, and if he bites me, I will skin you alive. These are typical stories that the Texas Rangers tell in their books, which are kind of like comic books. They shouldn't be used as real historical sources, rather to examine them like Joseph Campbell, uh, as myth and legend. Uh, yeah, there are too many instances of Texas Rangers just shooting Indians, in another case, Texas Rangers confront some Indians in North Texas, and one ranger sees an, in, an Indian walking up to him. I don't know if it was Comanche or what tribe. Don't remember right now. It's documented. Uh, walks up to him, showing the hand of peace, and this Texas Ranger shoots him dead, and then rifles through his pockets, taking his change and his tobacco and rolls a cigarette, and then exclaims that he would shoot any Indian for a cigarette. That's stories told by Texas Rangers, written in their books. Yes, the Texas Rangers were moving the, the Comanche Nation out of Texas uh, and the U.S. Army too. Uh, immediately after the uh, war with Mexico, the Comanches and other Native American tribes were forced to sign treaties, which forbade them from coming into any contact with the Germans. Hmm. And for several years, and actually it went on for decades, the U.S. Army and the Texas Rangers didn't know, need to know how friendly the Comanches and Apaches and Germans actually were. But the Germans and Comanches and Apaches always continued to trade with one another. And uh, this began uh, even before the, the Moisebach Treaty, the Comanche Treaty here in Fredericksburg. When Prince Carl of Somme's Braunfels came here in 1844, he signed a treaty with four Lipan Apache chiefs in San Antonio. There's not a historical plaque for this yet, but uh, I've talked with a number of people in the Lipan Apache tribe of Texas about this, and we hope to see a marker soon where this treaty took place between Prince Carl of Solms Braunfels representing the German Confederation and the Lipan Apache tribe of Texas. Lipan Apache tribe, uh, just a few years ago, celebrated this treaty at the German consulate in Houston, and there is a beautiful blanket hanging on the wall in commemoration of this treaty signing, which took place in 1844, three years before the Comanche Treaty. And um, so, yes, the, 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 the Germans did live in peace with the Comanches. This is very well documented, hundreds of, of sources for this, how the, the Germans lived in peace with the Comanches, and how they conducted uh, mutually beneficial trade. 
and, uh, and that the Comanches didn't really trust the Anglos in Texas and were afraid that they would be shot any time they were near them. So the Germans also, I mean, they, they had complicated, I mean, there were a lot of them and they were diverse, but apparently there was a strain of abolitionism among them. Is that right? Excuse me? The, apparently there were some abolitionists among the Germans and no one was really excited about slavery. The, the Germans were here in the, in the colonies of the Fabine and across Texas were all abolitionists. And uh, if any of them owned slaves, say, for example, Friedrich Armand Schruger himself, in a deal in leaving Fredericksburg as colonial director, took over the Nassau farm. Now, slaves were attached to property. And when the Germans purchased the Nassau farm down near LaGrange, it came with slaves attached to the property. They were opposed to slavery, but when you live in a land of slavery and you have these slaves attached to your property, you can only, if you set them free, they would be hunted down. So there's a problem there with that. But the rest of the Germans did not own slaves. Uh, Germany also had its own uh, form of serfdom. Mm -hmm. uh, not, I don't want to say slavery, but indentured surface, surface, yes. And uh, Fritz Goldbach wrote a great poem uh, while he lived in, in, in comfort. His old log cabin is still in comfort. And Fritz Goldbach and his brother Theodore Goldbach were uh, both intellectuals and, and poets uh, writing some, some really great poetry about the German settlements here. This uh, one poem is about uh, being an indentured servant to the Fabine, because all young, able-bodied men, as German settlers here, were required to do service in building bridges and roads. And he thought this was unjust, that they had to work out there and build these roads and not receive any pay. It was community service, which was forced upon them as uh, settlers. And uh, it, it's really more of a funny poem which they would read aloud when they were drinking Rhine wine at, at their singing festivals. And Rhine wine would be... Well, they actually imported oh, the wine, wine, wine of Germany wine. and beer <laughs> and, and water from Nassau. We have many places here myself. I have a few old bottles. It's not uncommon to find bottles uh, of, of clay sprudel that's sparkling water with a Nassau stamp on it imported from Germany. They drink sparkling water and and French and German wines out here on the frontier. If you read the, the diary of Elisa Wuppermann, this is well worth the read. She's living out here in the middle of Comanche territory, alone. Her husband goes off on a business trip. And uh, she invites guests over, and uh, they, they are university professors, and so she details well, in her wait, diary. To, to be clear, though, they weren't university professors here. Oh, many university professors, for example, Count Kopp, he moved to Sisterdale, known as a Latin community. Many of my and my forefathers uh, had more than 100 hours Latin and Greek uh, when they studied at universities or at the Andrian. Uh, these, at the time, studying Greek and, and, and the classics was the thing to do. In, in Germany, you either studied law or you studied theology. So most of the, the German uh, men and, and younger men and boys who came here had studied theology or law before they came here. So they were highly educated academic Germans who were politically active and when things went south with that in 1848. They were all politically active and before 1848, well in about the 1848 revolutions across Europe, Many of these, like uh, my forefathers, um, who weren't the 48 the 48ers, they were called Vormatzler, pre-Marchers, because the revolutions broke out in March of 1848. So Hammond Zeyler, for example, he was hired by Prince Karl of Salms Braunfels to become the first school teacher west of the Colorado in New Braunfels. He was a, 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 a Vormatzler. He had to leave Hildesheim, where he was still studying at the Andreanum, about to graduate, but he had been leading a forbidden singing society, and they were, they were singing forbidden songs about freedom. <laughs> freedom, and drinking, and democracy, and drinking. And, <laughs> and, uh, and he ran a, a, a little bar up on a hilltop overlooking Hildesheim, 
they call the booth holes. It's a not very nice four-star hotel now. And you can still sit out on the patio where these German revolutionary students and Burschenschaft would sing songs about democracy and freedom uh, in clear violation of the law of the land of the, the King of Hanover. Who was British and did not speak German. That's legit. <laughs> that is seriously weird. I just <laughs> and his, across the city of Ildesheim, there was another hilltop cafe where they were trying to sing even louder these forbidden songs of freedom. And uh, that was run by the Goldback brothers, Fritz and Theodore, who then built their log cabin in Comfort, Texas. So that's how a whole bunch of university professors ended up living in Comanche territory. Well, Adolf Fuchs, for example, uh, wrote, I have a, an original, very rare copy of his book, which uh, was a revolutionary book and uh, also condemned and forbidden. Uh, a few years ago in, in Schwerin, uh, looking for documents like this, I walked into an, well, first we went to the state archives, and they said, we don't have any archives here. They, the archives were burned down in 1848 by socialists. And the woman telling me this was a former East German socialist who was still running the archives at the time. It wasn't very friendly to me being from America, wanting to see these old documents. So she said, no, we don't have anything. And I said, well, do you have an antiquarian bookstore? A younger uh, woman who, who worked there came and told me, yes, there is an antiquarian bookstore just down the street. So I went in and I said, do you have anything from Adolf Fuchs? And I said, no. I said, well, do you have any newspapers from the 1840s? And she said, just those over there. Well, there was a stack three feet tall of old newspapers from the 1840s and I picked them up and the first newspaper that I picked up from 1847 had excerpts and commentary on Adolf Fuchs's book, which was then uh, forbidden by the censor of Germany. And so I have also a nice uh, newspaper. I purchased all those papers for about five dollars. Okay. And then so I have a nice collection of documenting uh, the, the struggle of the freedom of press and the censorship in Germany, writing about the problems of the church and uh, the church being controlled by the state. There was no separation of church and state. Uh, you had to be belong to the church of your local deity's choice. Your <laughs> your, your ruling prince would decide your religion for you, and uh, you had to pretty much do what you were told. They were tired of that. And and what happened also at the same time as the uh, democratic revolutions were coming along. In this pre-March period, it began in 1837 with the publications of books which, uh, by Bruno Bauer, for example, uh, which uh, called for reformation. And this period, 1837 to 1847, 1848, in Germany is also known as the Second Reformation. And three million people were excommunicated from their churches. And most of them came to the United States. So there's a really close tie between all the complicated radicalism and liberalism and democratic movements in Central Europe in the 1830s and 40s, and what was happening in Texas with Comanche and local law enforcement. It's yes. a very complicated history. Yes, yes. It is very complicated history, and we can't simplify it. Right. When we study Texas history, we have to study this deep, complex history of Central Europe also, and the mighty power of, of England. Uh, so let's come back to the woman whose husband went on the business trip. Back to uh, There was a woman whose husband went on a business trip. Oh, Elisa <laughs> Wilkerman. She left behind a, uh, this is a great source for Texas history. It's also been translated to English. It was on the internet for a while. It sort of comes and goes. I don't know who owns the copyrights for it now. But uh, this is essential, uh, I, I think, to any any education in Texas history, especially for young people. Elisa Buchmann is a young girl and she details her life here. Uh, and people in her life are interesting. She, she knows uh, Dr. Knoll, for example. I didn't know who Dr. Knoll was. Dr. Knoll was, uh, well, he was from uh, what's now Elberfeld, Germany. He was a member of the Revolutionary Parliament during the German Democratic Revolution. And he was uh, the doctor at that time of the Brownfels and would visit Elisa Buchmann. 
Uh, and like I said, she would always detail what she would put on the table, what type of wine. She would serve an aperitif. She would serve one wine with, with uh, one dish and another wine later on. And uh, what music would accompany this dinner on piano? Now, this is on the frontier of Texas with roaming bands of Comanches. Now, Comanches too, and a lot of people like to look at them as having maybe even stone arrowheads, I don't know. But they weren't exactly the wild Indians. Some of them were, as documented by Richard Petri, a German artist who painted Comanches. Richard Petri and Hammond Munkwitz painted the Comanches as they were. Some Comanches preferred to wear the traditional loincloth. Buffalo Hunt, for example, was known to wear the loincloth and a top hat and <laughs> tails. Uh, a, a, a fine <laughs> <That's great. laughs> But uh, that was his own personal style. Many other Comanches preferred to dress like Western dress. They, they would wear beautiful dresses which they purchased in San Antonio, for example. Uh, so the, the West was, as they say, won partly by complicated law enforcement with the Rangers. The with Comanches had had, had 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 contact with Europeans for 300 years prior to Texans coming along. And uh, you know, the, 300 years ago, they were trading with the French up in the north. Yeah. And, uh, and stood between the French and the Spanish, and there were several uh, including the, the massacre at San Salva, where they were known to have used uh, French guns. I believe that was 1783, 1787, that period, uh, when they wanted to stop the, the Spanish incursion into this territory. They uh, are said to have waited until the, the walls of the new mission and fortress were just tall enough to use as a corral before <laughs> they killed all of the Spaniards. Okay. But back to Elisa Buferman, like I said, this is really something every kid should read. She, she documents her life here, and then she moves out here to the Upper Guadalupe to establish a trading post, a stop along the way between New Braunfels and Fredericksburg, a place where people could water their horses, have dinner, spend the night. And uh, her husband goes off on a business trip, and her horse, Bill, who was given to her by my great-great-grandfather, Herman Seeley. Herman Seeley also writes a lot about Bill himself. Well, Bill disappeared one night, and there she was left out on the frontier without a horse. Hammond Zela then writes in his diary how he was a school teacher in New Braunfels, wakes up early to go to school, and he walks by what he thought would be the empty stable where Bill had resided. And there's Bill, standing in the stable, eating from a bowl, a, a, a bucket of corn, and another bucket of water. And he was completely covered in Comanche war paint, <laughs> and his mane and tail were braided with Comanche feathers. So they, they borrowed the horse. So his Comanche <laughs> friends returned his horse, okay. or borrowed it, and went on a, an excursion to Mexico, perhaps, and, uh, and returned it to its rightful owner, they knew. Okay. Uh, Herman Seeley has also done sketches of him riding on Bill together with Comanche Chiefs. Uh, it's an interesting piece of artwork he did.